Over 50 years ago in Springfield, New Jersey, suburban normality was shattered for the entire community when a family dog returned to its owner with something extremely disturbing held in its mouth, a decomposing human arm. Horrified, the owner swiftly informed the police, triggering a thorough search for the source of the body piece. It didn't take long for a body to be found on top of a nearby cliff, which would soon come to be identified as Jeanette De Palmer, a 16-year-old girl who had been missing for six weeks. This grim finding ignited widespread panic and speculation, especially as the hill where her body was found, known locally as Devil's Teeth, was adorned with occult symbols, leading many to believe she had been placed on a makeshift altar. Rumors spread like wildfire, with locals and even police officers accusing an alleged coven of witches of using De Palma in a brutal and shocking human sacrifice. Others pointed fingers at a satanic group, intensifying the atmosphere of fear and suspicion. Even though it occurred at the height of the satanic panic, could this case be the rare exception of a true ritualistic crime? Or has the story of Satanists, witches, and human sacrifice been morphed and exaggerated over the decades, undermining the truth behind this tragic case? After decades of speculation about cult rituals due to police reports about the crime scene featuring occult objects, handcrafted crosses, a makeshift coffin of sticks, and creepy arrows signaling to the body's location, new information that has been uncovered by keen amateur investigators revealing what the crime scene actually looked like has finally shed some light on the truth behind this haunting case. So let's take a look at this chilling unsolved cold case together and see if we can answer the question, what really happened to Jeanette De Palmer? Witchcraft, satanic rituals, and serial killers. The real story of Jeanette De Palma's tragic murder. In the late summer of 1972, when the sun-dappled streets of Springfield, New Jersey, were adorned with the hues of fading warmth, a cloud of despair descended upon the picturesque town. Jeanette De Palma, a 16-year-old beacon of light in the close-knit community, vanished without a trace, shattering the tranquil facade of the idyllic town. She left her home, informing her mother that she was heading to a friend's place allegedly planning to take a train. It's believed she hitchhiked her way, a decision that appears to have led to her vanishing. Neither did she reach her friend's destination nor return home that fateful evening. Concerned, her parents reported her absence to the Springfield Police Department the following day. The De Palma family, pillars of the local church and respected members of the community, found their world unraveling. Jeanette, the embodiment of youthful vitality and kindness, disappeared in the blink of an eye leaving behind a void that echoed through the quiet corners of Springfield. Friends, family, and neighbors were plunged into a state of collective shock and disbelief, grappling with the inexplicable absence of a girl described as vibrant, compassionate, and full of dreams. As each day passed, the town's initial bewilderment transformed into a gnawing unease. The mystery of Jeanette's disappearance loomed over Springfield like a haunting specter, casting long shadows over the once tranquil streets. The laughter of children playing in the parks was replaced by hushed whispers, and the vibrant colors of summer faded into a somber palette of worry and fear. Bound by a shared sense of loss, the community rallied in an effort to find Jeanette. Volunteers combed through fields and forests, their footsteps echoing the collective hope of uncovering a clue that would lead them to the missing girl. Candlelight vigils illuminated the night as prayers were whispered for Jeanette's safe return. Yet amid the outpouring of support and the tireless search efforts, Jeanette's whereabouts remained an enigma, a void in the heart of Springfield that seemed impossible to fill. The Grizzly Discovery Six weeks after Jeanette's mysterious disappearance had cast a pall of uncertainty over Springfield, the town's worst fears were realized in a gruesome and unsettling manner. It began with a chance discovery that would haunt the town for decades to come. A decomposing human arm discovered outside an apartment complex on Wilson Road. Police accounts revealed that the arm had been carried from the Hudile Quarry, a former crystal and gravel quarry situated between the Baltrusol Golf Club and Wachung Reservation, divided by Interstate 78. The town, already on edge, was thrust into a state of collective shock and horror. Jeanette's fate, long shrouded in mystery, was now unveiled in the most nightmarish manner possible. Following the trail left by the morbid find, investigators ventured deep into the heart of the Hudile Quarry. A place once marked by the echoes of industry but now forever etched in infamy. There, atop a cliff on September 19, 1972, they discovered Jeanette's remains. Her body was now a haunting testament to a life tragically cut short. The scene they encountered was as perplexing as it was macabre. Wooden logs, crossed with a sinister intention, created a makeshift altar around her body. Eerie symbolism permeated the air, raising disturbing questions about the circumstances of her demise. Rumors of occult symbols and ritualistic markings only deepened the intrigue, painting a picture of a crime scene that seemed to defy rational explanation. 
The atmosphere was thick with an unspoken dread, as if the very earth beneath their feet held secrets too dark to comprehend. The discovery sent shockwaves through the community, leaving its residents paralyzed with fear and disbelief. In the initial stages of the inquiry, Springfield law enforcement received a tip concerning a homeless individual residing in the woods near the quarry, commonly referred to as Red by the locals. It was claimed that he hastily vacated his makeshift campsite shortly after De Palma's disappearance. Although this lead appeared hopeful at first, the Union County Prosecutor's Office eventually concluded that Red was unrelated to De Palma's tragic demise. The questions that now loomed over Springfield were as unsettling as they were enigmatic. Who could perpetrate such a heinous act? What twisted mind could orchestrate such a macabre display? The entire town was now gripped by a chilling realization. Their neighbor, their friend, had fallen victim to a darkness that lurked in the shadows. A darkness that was real, and that was deadly. The Autopsy The Union County Medical Examiner, Dr. Bernard Ehrenberg, wrote a somber report detailing Jeanette's position. She was found lying face down encircled by natural rock formations. Advanced decomposition left investigators with limited avenues for determining the cause of her demise. Identifying her proved a daunting task too, due to how severely decomposed her body was, rendering dental records the only means to confirm her identity. The state of her remains was so advanced that conducting a traditional autopsy became impossible. Skeletal x-rays, while ruling out signs of physical trauma like blunt force injuries, bullet wounds, or fractures, failed to unveil the true cause of her death, leaving the mystery unresolved and leaving a blank void for rumors, whispers, and shadows to fill. In an attempt to unravel the mystery, samples of her clothing were carefully collected and dispatched to federal authorities for extensive analysis. The FBI crime lab delved into the case examining Jeanette's garments, including her blouse, slacks, and underwear, alongside soil samples from the scene. These were meticulously compared with hairs collected from her dresser drawer and her body, but their microscopic and chemical scrutiny revealed no trace of foreign hairs amid Jeanette's clothing. Disturbingly, the stains discovered in her underwear, bra, blouse, and slacks had degraded too extensively for meaningful blood and semen testing. The Satanic Panic Jeanette's tragic demise unfolded in the backdrop of the 1970s Jesus Movement, a period marked by the resurgence of religious faith amidst declining communes and the waning of the free love era. Families sought solace in evangelical beliefs, including Jeanette's own, who were loyal members of the local Assemblies of God Evangel Church in Elizabeth. Yet this era was also tainted by a wave of unfounded fear known as the Satanic Panic, where sensationalized rumors of witchcraft and Satanism captured public attention. Jeanette's tragic demise unfolded merely three years after the infamous Manson family murders, casting a sinister shadow over an otherwise peaceful time. The fact that her lifeless body was discovered on a cliff ominously referred to by locals as the Devil's Teeth didn't help matters. The searchers who made the grim discovery described finding Jeanette's body within a makeshift coffin shape crafted from wood, surrounded by crosses fashioned from branches. The whole scene, they claimed, was ritualistic and had occult implications. They even claimed that arrows carved into trees had pointed them towards the corpse, as if the killer or killers had wanted it to be uncovered. Was this entire scene a ritualistic stage designed for the authorities to unpack? Swiftly, whispers of occult practices echoed statewide and the community was soon inundated with speculations, ranging from tales of a secretive coven practicing dark magic to fears of satanic ritual sacrifices. Local authorities grappling with the perplexing circumstances actively looked into the unsettling possibility of black witchcraft and satanic rituals being linked to Jeanette's tragic end. Adding to the enigma, Jeanette's parents were portrayed as devout souls, with the father emphasizing her mission to guide others towards faith and her active involvement in community initiatives, especially aiding drug addicts. It was revealed that she had ambitious plans of attending a Bible college, underscoring her unwavering commitment to her beliefs. The community quickly began to speculate that she had been targeted by these supposed witches or Satanists because of her devout beliefs. Around the same time, the area near Wachong Reservation, only two miles from the site of Jeanette's discovery, became shrouded in disturbing incidents. Reports surfaced of sacrifices involving deceased animals, casting a chilling pall over the vicinity. Union County Park Police stumbled upon an eerie tableau within the park. Burning candles, a chilling bowl of blood, and lifeless pigeons, their necks cruelly snapped. An unsettling scene that deepened the aura of fear and added to the sense that cults were operating within the area. Intriguingly, a 1972 Courier News report hinted at Union County investigators enlisting the help of a witch to assess the legitimacy of the site where Jeanette was found. The family's pastor, Reverend James Tate of the Assemblies of God Evangel, 
confirmed the presence of the mysterious witch at the scene, leaving lingering questions about what, if anything, she might have discovered amidst the eerie remnants of the occult. During that unsettling period in New Jersey's history, self-proclaimed witches and warlocks were not merely the stuff of legend, but a grim reality. The spotlight fell on a woman named Lilith Sinclair, a sinister figure who had established her own grotto, a congregation of Satanists branching off from the Church of Satan in San Francisco. Sinclair's Grotto, a dark assembly of more than 30 members, found its unsettling home in the quiet Middlesex County borough of Spotswood. However, the true extent of the darkness she orchestrated remained largely obscured, with details about her activities shrouded in secrecy. Oddly, the identity of the witch allegedly summoned to the site where Jeanette's lifeless form lay was never disclosed, leaving an air of chilling mystery. A year prior to Jeanette's death, John List in nearby Westfield had meticulously executed a plan to murder his entire family. List shot his wife, mother, and three children, positioning their bodies specifically in his Victorian mansion. The bodies remained undiscovered for nearly a month, and List, assuming a new identity, wasn't arrested until 1989. In a report from April 1990, it was revealed that List believed he was sending his family to join God, saving them from public humiliation due to financial difficulties. Despite attempts by his defense attorney to introduce claims that List's daughter was a practicing witch, the judge consistently barred such testimony. List was ultimately convicted in 1990 for five counts of murder and received five consecutive life sentences. He passed away in 2008 while still incarcerated. Just months before the List case, another New Jersey murder left a community fearful of Satan's influence on the youth. Patrick Michael Newell was 20 years old when two friends bound his arms and legs behind his back, threw him into a sandpit pond in Millville, and waited for him to drown. One of his friends told police that Newell belonged to a Satan worshippers sect, and felt he had to die violently to be put in charge of 40 leagues of demons. The teen said Newell had urged the two friends to bind him, which they did, to perform a satanic ritual, and then to push him into the pond. The allegations were enough to call in the criminal investigation section of the New Jersey State Police to investigate the possible existence of what they called a voodoo cult. Both teens were eventually convicted for Newell's death. These eerie local cases only added to the sense of fear and paranoia surrounding Jeanette's untimely demise, leaving the community haunted by a multitude of unsettling possibilities. While nowadays most people would dismiss the idea of occult murders, the community at the time strongly believed that Satanists, witches, or something even more dark and disturbing was involved in the ritualistic murder of young Jeanette. The investigator's perspective. Donald Schwert, a retired Springfield police officer, was the one who stumbled upon Jeanette's lifeless body, an experience that has stayed with him even after three decades of retirement. He confessed that the memory of that day still haunts him, especially because he had five daughters of his own, making the tragedy painfully relatable. Recalling the grim scene, Schwert described finding Jeanette's body on a sizable mound within the quarry. He vividly remembered the fact that she wore tan pants and a navy blue shirt, lying in stark contrast to the rugged surroundings. Schwert dismissed the swirling rumors about witchcraft and Satanism, attributing them to misinterpretations by fellow investigators. According to him, these rumors began when others climbed the rock face and noticed stones positioned around Jeanette's head, leading to misguided associations with satanic rituals. He remained steadfast in his skepticism, refusing to buy into these sensational theories. Instead, Schwert leaned towards a different possibility. He suspected drug involvement, speculating that Jeanette might have overdosed. However, his theory hit a dead end when toxicology reports returned negative for drugs. As a seasoned officer who had risen to the rank of lieutenant before retirement, Schwert had knowledge that some of the individuals Jeanette associated with were involved in drugs. Despite this, he held on to hope that someone, after all these years, might come forward with a crucial piece of information. Sadly, his expectations were never met, leaving the mystery surrounding Jeanette's tragic fate unresolved. The journalist investigation. In their gripping investigation chronicled in Death on the Devil's Teeth, the strange murder that shocked suburban New Jersey, Jesse P. Pollock and Mark Moran delved into the perplexing case and came to some startling conclusions. Casting doubt on long-standing rumors of a police cover-up, alleged witchcraft, and potential connections to other young women's murders, the authors provided a fresh perspective on this chilling mystery. When the editors of Weird New Jersey Jesse P. Pollock and Mike Moran embarked on their quest for truth, they faced initial hurdles. They first heard about the case in 1997, when a curious letter arrived at the offices of Weird New Jersey, penned by an intrigued fan named Billy Martin. The brief message titled In the Wachung Mountains hinted at a disturbing incident, an alleged ritual sacrifice in the Hudial Quarry near Springfield. According to Martin, 
A local dog's macabre discovery had triggered an investigation, though he remained uncertain about its authenticity. In an era predating the ease of online searches, the editors faced challenges verifying this mysterious tale. Despite their efforts, they couldn't unearth additional information. Faced with the lack of corroborating evidence, they made a decision, and Martin's letter found its way into Weird NJ No. 9, published in October of that year. Its publication sparked a reaction among readers who had grown up in Union County during the 1970s. One reply stood out, revealing the victim's identity to them. Her name was Jeanette De Palma, and she was found on an altar. As time passed, the fog of mystery began to lift. Details emerged about the case to them. Jeanette had vanished one afternoon in August 1972 while hitchhiking in Springfield Township. Her lifeless body was later discovered in the woods surrounding the Hudile Quarry, after a dog had retrieved her arm, leading back to the Baltusrol Gardens apartment complex on nearby Wilson Road. Whispers circulated among the townsfolk of Union County, suggesting that her disappearance and subsequent murder bore eerie, ritualistic undertones. The desolate hilltop location where her body was found was rumored to be adorned with symbols associated with occult practices. According to the grapevine, the young girl's body had allegedly been placed upon a makeshift altar deep within the woods. Various renditions of the Jeanette de Palma saga pointed accusatory fingers at either a secretive coven of witches or a local sect of Satanists for her untimely demise. Yet, as they embarked on their investigation into this chilling tale, an unsettling truth emerged. Even after three decades, fear had immobilized the memories of those who had witnessed the crime. People they questioned seemed to cling to the same sparse yet gruesome details, yet none dared to step forward for an on-record conversation or to see their names in print. A sentiment shared even by the Springfield Police Department, shrouding the case in an impenetrable veil of silence. The consensus among the individuals they interviewed regarding Jeanette's murder appeared to be unanimous on specific points. There was a belief that it had cult connections, suspicions of a police cover-up surrounding the case, and a prevailing notion that Jeanette's killers were possibly still at large. Yet, amidst these chilling theories, a haunting question lingered. Was Jeanette De Palma's demise truly orchestrated by some malevolent force that had infiltrated the tranquil neighborhoods of suburban Union County in the early 1970s? Or had the passage of time in the relentless gossip mill distorted the case's facts, sensationalizing the crime beyond recognition? This was the question that plagued their thoughts a question to which they found no definitive answer in their initial article. Following its publication, however, a wave of new leads flooded in. Some of these leads were ambiguous or conflicting, others were cryptic, and a few were downright eerie. The tips they received varied in nature. Some were cautionary, while others carried an unmistakable sinister undertone. Most of the leads arrived anonymously, arriving in plain white envelopes devoid of any return address. Some were from individuals residing in the very area where the tragic incident had unfolded while others came from those who had long since moved away but still clung to memories of the case. Memories tinged with horror. This is in regards to the story of Jeanette De Palma. When her body was found, it was not on an altar. There were logs around her body. She needs to be put at rest finally. I'm sure something out there or someone must be able to give you some more info about the case. Maybe she did herself in because at that time there was a lot of Satan stuff going on in the reservation. Sorry I can't give you my name for more reasons than one. Anonymous. I was a young teenager when the discovery of Jeanette De Palma happened and lived in the next town. About two years prior, there was much talk in my school about a cult in the surrounding area. They were known as the Witches. They must have let it be known in the area that they planned to kill a child on or about Halloween, either by kidnapping and sacrificing them or by poison. I remember being anxious about this because I went trick-or-treating in those days. I didn't read the newspapers, but I was well aware of the dog that brought home the girl's arm. The story was well known, as I lived within three miles of the quarry. Anonymous. Apparently my mom knew Jeanette, because Jeanette worked at a clothing store in Summit named Sealfonts. They were about the same age, which should have been around 13 or 14. My mother and some of her friends used to hang out and camp in the quarry. That is, until they found out about the murder. My uncle, who was a Summit cop, came to warn my mother against going there any longer. From what I was told, these details were never released to the public. When the dog brought the arm home and the search for the body started, they found arrows carved in the trees that would lead you to the body. The location was high up on the cliff. All around her body were dead animals tied to trees with string and some in jars. Shortly thereafter, there were reports of animals being mutilated and hung in the same fashion in the Wachung Reservation, which is also very close to the scene of the crime. The Wachung Reservation, or the Res, has been reported to be the center of devil worship activity for years. Anonymous. I too forgot about the death of Jeanette De Palma. 
but I can never forget all the weird stuff that happened in Summit, Mountainside, Springfield, and for me, the majority of it in the Wachung Reservation. Now that I think back on it, it would make sense that Springfield would cover up the murder so as to not tarnish the reputation of the town. I know that the sacrifice that my friends saw was never reported or was in the newspaper, but I remember, and I sure as hell know they do too. Anonymous. I knew Jeanette De Palma very well and my friend went out with her. We used to go to church with her. She was a religious girl, but I think her parents forced her to go to church. She was kind of a little bit of a wild girl. We all went up to the house and helped look for her and spoke with her parents. I don't think my friend, who was quite in love with her, ever recovered from it. I was very surprised that the police don't have anything in the archives about her. It's funny. My wife read the story and she says, don't even get involved, it's a satanic thing. It was all the talk of Union County for two weeks. Then boom, it was gone. It left the papers very quickly. That is very spooky in itself. In the past 30 years, I think I've only thought about that girl twice. And I felt a little ashamed of myself. And then I read the weird NJ article and I said, holy cow, everyone forgot about Jeanette De Palma, that poor girl, Rich. The fact that the case and the strange details surrounding it exists at all in the public consciousness these days can largely be attributed to the articles that Weird NJ published. And when the editors embarked on their own full investigation into Jeanette's inexplicable demise, they encountered staunch resistance from local law enforcement. The police asserted that all records and evidence related to the De Palma case had been obliterated during the Hurricane Floyd flooding in 1999. Today, the truth stands revealed. Claims of obliteration were false all along. The truth. In a significant turn of events, copies of Jeanette's long elusive case file were finally secured from the Union County Prosecutor's Office. This achievement followed persistent efforts by Pollock, who collaborated with former UCPO Director of Communications, Mark Spivey in 2019. Together, they submitted a detailed file request under the New Jersey Open Public Records Act and the Freedom of Information Act, overcoming years of denials from past acting prosecutors. Although the process faced substantial delays, exacerbated by the challenges posed by COVID-19 and personnel changes, the UCPO ultimately released the majority of Jeanette De Palma's case file to Pollock in February 2021. Notably, this cache of information included crime scene photographs that some New Jersey police officials had previously described as missing. Despite the sensitive redaction of Jeanette's remains from the photographs, a stark truth emerged. Upon a thorough examination, Weird NJ confidently asserted that there was no evidence of occult activity surrounding Jeanette's tragic demise. Strikingly absent from the crime scene photos were the alleged crosses made from sticks and twigs and the mysterious halo of stones that were rumored to have been placed around Jeanette's body. Likewise, there were no signs of the rumored animal sacrifices that had long circulated among the hushed whispers of Union County residents. The closest semblance to a cross discovered near the remains was merely two decaying tree branches that had evidently fallen in that location long before Jeanette had found her final resting place. Not a single arrow carved in trees or any semblance of an altar was discernible in these revealing photographs. This situation only amplifies the perplexity surrounding the claims made by the press about these photographs back in 1972. A piece published in the September 29, 1972 edition of the Elizabeth Daily Journal, titled Girl Sacrificed in Witch Rite, asserted that detectives were honing in on elements of black witchcraft and Satan worship in the case. The article claimed that detectives scrutinizing the death scene photos had been forced to consider the possibility that the death had been part of a ritual sacrifice, with pieces of wood being viewed as occult symbols, including two pieces arranged on the ground above her head. Additional wood, the article had claimed, framed her body like a coffin. This article marked the inception of connecting Jeanette De Palma's death with witchcraft and Satanism. However, even a cursory glance at the crime scene diagram crafted by UCPO investigator Glenn Owens disputes these supposed indicators of black magic and Satan worship. The two pieces of wood crossed on the ground over her head were, in reality, parallel to Jeanette's body. Her right arm rested on the vertically placed log, while the horizontally positioned log lay just beyond her head. Both logs dwarfed Jeanette's entire body in size. The claims of logs forming a coffin-like structure around Jeanette's body appear exaggerated. Owen's diagram reveals that the branches fell in a manner resembling an open rectangle, not a trapezoid as reported by some newspapers in 1972. Given the dense overgrowth of the woods, it's plausible to assume that the Hudal quarry contained numerous other branches that naturally fell into common shapes making such formations far from unique or indicative of sinister activities. The density of the overgrowth itself presented a startling revelation. 
Despite repeated claims from retired Springfield PD investigators suggesting that the location where Jeanette's body was discovered was a common party spot where she likely succumbed to an overdose while reveling with fellow teenagers who fled in fear of legal consequences rather than providing medical assistance, the actual death scene photos painted a drastically different picture. The site where Jeanette's remains were found appeared significantly more overgrown than any previous descriptions the editors had received. Countless large plants and bushes surrounded the area contradicting the notion of it being a gathering place. Notably absent from the evidence reports and the multitude of photographs released in February 2021 were any signs of a party or social gathering at the scene. Instead, the contents of Jeanette's purse, intriguingly discovered about eight feet south of her remains, took center stage. Items meticulously listed in the evidence reports and captured in accompanying photos included a pack of Marcal tissues, a Vicks inhaler, a compact lipstick, a comb, a key on a ring, a clear vial with an unknown substance resembling a coracetin bottle. Jeanette's mother had mentioned her daughter having a mild cold on the day she vanished, and a small eyeshadow box. Conspicuously absent, however, was Jeanette's purse itself, along with any money or a wallet. This glaring absence strongly suggested foul play. It seemed apparent that her killer had taken her purse and her cross necklace, perhaps as grisly souvenirs. The absence of the cross necklace, a detail consistently reported missing by her family and corroborated by the reports released in February 2021, deepened the mystery surrounding her tragic demise. This release of information marked a monumental moment for Jeanette's family, friends, and dedicated readers of Weird NJ who had followed the case for decades. But while some questions have been answered by the release of this information, including the dispelling of any occult elements in Jeanette's death and the confirmation that her purse was never recovered, new and perplexing queries have surfaced. Why were her cross necklace and purse taken from her body? How did certain individuals within the Springfield Police Department and the Union County Prosecutor's Office come to believe in an occult connection to the case while examining the crime scene photos? Why did numerous police officials persist for nearly half a century in claiming that Jeanette's case file and evidence had been destroyed in 1999 due to flooding caused by Hurricane Floyd, the shadow of a serial killer? Speculations about Jeanette's fate have led some to consider the possibility that she might have fallen victim to a notorious serial killer. During the 1970s, a menacing presence haunted the vicinity. Richard Cottingham, infamously known as the Torso Killer, preyed upon young girls and women. Despite his outward appearance as a family man residing in a middle-class New Jersey neighborhood, Cottingham's heinous crimes painted a darker picture. Working as a computer operator in New York, he clandestinely terrorized the community. Cottingham's modus operandi was chillingly consistent. He tortured, raped, and brutally murdered his victims before callously discarding their bodies in wooded areas. His body count, by his own horrifying admission, ranged between 85 and 100 young women before his eventual capture. In a disturbing twist in 2021, Cottingham reached out to Jesse P. Pollock, hinting at his possible involvement in Jeanette's fate while she was hitchhiking. Pollock promptly handed over the unsettling correspondence to the Union County Prosecutor's Office. These letters have been documented in the revised edition of Death on the Devil's Teeth. Despite this shocking revelation, law enforcement, as of 2023, has remained silent, leaving the community gripped in fear and uncertainty. So what do you think really happened in this tragic case? Were the decades of stories about witchcraft, Satanists, and ritual sacrifice nothing more than rumors fueled by a nation gripped with satanic panic? Did these rumors and whispers ultimately undermine the case, preventing other important avenues that could have led to progress and answers from being explored? Was a notorious serial killer actually responsible for the crime, as he seems to have claimed? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Thanks again for watching this latest true crime video on my channel. And please check out some of my other cold case deep dives that are already up on the channel. I'm trying to release at least one true crime video weekly for the rest of the year, including both new cases and edited versions of some of my previous uploads with improved audio and quality. If you have any suggestions for cases to explore or look into, feel free to comment below and let me know. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. In the annals of Swedish crime history, the Keeler's Park murder stands as a haunting tale etched into the nation's memory. On a summer day, July 23, 1997, the tranquility of Gothenburg's park was shattered by the grim discovery of an unidentified man's lifeless body. The victim, cruelly shot twice with a pistol, 
was revealed to be Yosef Ben Medor, a 36-year-old Algerian national and an openly gay man who had called Sweden home for many years. After months of painstaking investigation, the elusive perpetrators were finally captured. The culprits, Jan Notveit, the 22-year-old frontman of the extreme metal band Dissection, and his accomplice Vlad, then 20, also known as Freider Namidial, now identified as Victor Draconi, were both musicians residing in Sweden. Notveit and Vlad, founders of the sinister satanic cult Temple of the Black Light, had disturbingly discussed the idea of human sacrifices before they committed their grisly act against Medor. But was their murder really committed as part of their satanic beliefs, as they have claimed? Or was a more real-world, bigoted motive behind their actions? Let's find out together. Black Metal, Satanism and Murder, The Killing at Keeler's Park On a tranquil summer afternoon in Keeler's Park, Gothenburg, Sweden, on July 23, 1997, a picturesque setting turned into a crime scene. A 16-year-old boy out for a leisurely walk stumbled upon a grim discovery. A lifeless body lying face down at the base of an ancient water tower. The police were promptly summoned, revealing a chilling scene. The man had been brutally shot twice, once in the back, the bullet piercing his heart, and then again in the head after he had fallen to the ground. Beside the body lay a bag and a head cap, but no identification could be found. The victim was later identified as Joseph Ben Medor, a 36-year-old Algerian national who had been residing in Sweden for a decade. Joseph was openly gay, and his frequent companion was a Finnish-looking man, presumed to be his boyfriend. Initially, suspicion fell upon the boyfriend due to their known tumultuous relationship, his lack of alibi, and his head cap being found at the crime scene. But despite the initial focus on Joseph's boyfriend, after 12 days in custody, he was released and clear of all charges. But this left a gaping void for the investigators. If it wasn't the boyfriend, then who had committed this horrific act? Assassination? In the turbulent backdrop of Algeria's civil war, a sinister web of violence and political unrest gripped the nation from 1991 to 2002. Amidst this chaos, an extremist organization known as the Armed Islamic Group of Algeria, or GIA, emerged with a brutal agenda to establish an Islamic state by toppling the existing government. In the midst of this civil strife, Joseph's lifeless body was discovered in Keeler's Park. And it soon transpired that the GIA, notorious for their ruthless tactics, had paid Joseph a visit just days before his body was found. Suspecting a political assassination due to Joseph's vocal opposition to the GIA, investigators initially pursued this lead. However, this path of inquiry proved equally elusive. Despite their efforts, the investigators failed to unearth substantial evidence linking Joseph's murder to the GIA's political motives. Frustration mounted as their new theory crumbled under the weight of uncertainty. Months passed, and soon hope began to wane. The victim. Born into a loving family, Joseph Ben Medor was raised by his parents in the heart of the Casbah of Algiers. Kind-hearted and intelligent, Joseph was known for his generosity and willingness to extend a helping hand beyond the ordinary. Despite not completing his formal education, he possessed a keen mind and was multilingual, fluent in both English and Swedish. His days were spent as a tailor, meticulously crafting garments for others. Anecdotes from his family painted a picture of his remarkable generosity. Once asked for a blender, he returned not with one but with six, exemplifying his extraordinary spirit. Life's twists led Joseph away from Algeria, when a friend invited him on the journey to France and the Nordic countries. Embracing this opportunity, he eventually found his home in Sweden, where he settled and built a life for himself. As we reflect on his life, let us remember Joseph not just for the way his journey ended, but for the way he lived, full of compassion, generosity, and the enduring impact he made on those fortunate enough to know him. May his soul find eternal peace. A major twist. In the chilling winter of December 15, 1997, a 23-year-old woman stepped into a police station in Stockholm, her face etched with fear and desperation. Her purpose was twofold, to seek refuge from her abusive boyfriend Vlad and to disclose a haunting revelation. Trembling, she recounted a macabre tale Vlad had confided in her, implicating him and his 20-year-old friend John as the culprits behind the Keeler's Park murder that had sent shockwaves through Gothenburg. According to her harrowing account, Vlad and John had lured their victim Joseph into their sinister trap during a chance encounter on the streets of Gothenburg. Together, they led Joseph to the eerie solitude of Keeler's Park. There, they attempted to immobilize him with an electroshock weapon, but their plan went awry. In a desperate bid for escape, Joseph sprinted away, only to be ruthlessly shot in the back by Vlad. As Joseph lay defenseless on the cold ground, Vlad passed the weapon to John, who callously fired a second fatal shot into Joseph's head. The woman, stricken with terror, also divulged that she knew the whereabouts of the murder weapon, a 9mm pistol. 
a crucial detail that shocked the investigators. Stockholm police swiftly reached out to their counterparts in Gothenburg, verifying that certain elements of her account aligned eerily with the crime scene, raising the chilling possibility that her gruesome narrative held the key to solving the Keeler's Park murder mystery. The darkness of that winter night was juxtaposed against the glimmer of a potential breakthrough, as detectives meticulously pursued the leads provided by the courageous informant, determined to bring justice to Joseph and closure to a grieving community, an altar of death. In a dramatic turn of events, the wheels of justice began to grind relentlessly in two cities, Stockholm and Gothenburg, as law enforcement closed in on the suspects linked to the Keeler's Park murder. First, the spotlight fell on Vlad, who was swiftly apprehended at his Stockholm residence. The arrest, made on the very day of the shocking revelations, was marked by the chilling discovery of a 9mm pistol, just as the woman had claimed, which was seized from his possession. As investigators delved deeper into Vlad's abode, they unearthed a macabre tableau. Among the eerie artifacts found were a satanic altar, fragments of human hair, bone pieces, a bottle filled with human blood, and a weathered skull believed to be the result of grave robbery. To add to the horror, a collection of films depicting human abductions sent shivers down the spines of the seasoned detectives. The evidence appeared damning, strengthening the case against Vlad. Simultaneously, the net tightened around Jan Notveit, the second suspect in this gruesome saga. Swift police action led to John's arrest at his Gothenburg apartment a few days later. The arrest of both Vlad and John marked a pivotal moment in the pursuit of justice, setting the stage for a legal battle that would unravel the dark secrets surrounding the Keeler's Park murder. Amid the fervor of these arrests, another unresolved tragedy lingered in the background. The unsolved case of Malin Olsen, a 16-year-old girl found strangled in a cemetery in 1994, who police also believed Vlad and John to be responsible for. However, they were never able to definitively link the pair to the crime, leaving a mystery that remains hauntingly open to this day. The Temple of the Black Light In the chilling depths of Stockholm's winter, a sinister alliance was unmasked, revealing a shocking connection between darkness, ritualistic beliefs, and the heinous crime that rocked Gothenburg. The arrest of Vlad and his accomplice, John Nodveit, shed light on the secretive world of the misanthropic Luciferian Order, an occult organization founded in Sweden in 1995, also known as the Temple of the Black Light. Vlad and John were active members of the MLO, a group that delved into chaos Gnostic beliefs, seeking the true light of Lucifer through dark Gnostic and satanic magical systems. Their sinister practices included meditation, invocations of demons, and grisly animal sacrifices, particularly cats procured through classified ads. In the weeks leading up to the murder, the MLO, including Vlad and John, gathered at Notveit's residence to compile a chilling list of potential victims for their ominous human sacrifices. Among the targets were a defected MLO member, various bandmates of the duo, and even Notveit's own girlfriend. These malevolent plans prompted other MLO members to defect, refusing to partake in such sinister deeds, dwindling the active membership to a mere three individuals, John, Vlad, and Vlad's girlfriend. The motive behind this ghastly crime, deeply intertwined with the MLO's chaotic beliefs, remained shrouded in mystery. As detectives delved into the twisted minds of the perpetrators, the lingering question echoed through the corridors of justice. Was the murder of Joseph Ben Meduer a human sacrifice, driven by the dark tenets of Satanism, or a manifestation of an even more sinister and elusive force? The investigation, guided by relentless determination, pressed forward, unraveling the intricate web of malevolence woven by the MLO and inching closer to the chilling truth behind this nightmarish crime. Dissection John Notveit was the head of a black metal band called Dissection, a pioneering force that blended black metal with melodic death metal. Dissection's unique musical style earned them recognition as one of the most important and influential extreme metal bands. To understand the motives behind this unsettling murder case, it's important that we touch on some history surrounding the black metal scene at the time, where a series of violent incidents marked the turbulent path of this subgenre of heavy metal. In the early 1990s, the black metal landscape was marred by tragedies, including the shocking suicide of Per Olin, the lead singer of the Norwegian band Mayhem in 1991. Olin's bandmate, Oystein Arseth, not only discovered his body, but callously took photographs and collected fragments of his skull, later displaying them at the Helvete record shop in Oslo. Tragedy struck again when Bard Faust Eithen, an associate of Arseth, stabbed a homosexual man in 1992, driven by homophobic motives. In 1993, Erseth himself fell victim to violence, stabbed to death by Varg Vikernes, a Norwegian musician known for his solo project Burzum. Vikernes, also facing accusations of church burnings, claimed self-defense, 
stating that Arseth had planned to murder him. Vikernis was sentenced to 21 years in prison in 1994, marking a grim chapter in Black Metal's history. The tale of John Notvite and Vlad thus became another grim chapter in the annals of Black Metal, echoing the turbulent and enigmatic nature of this subgenre. The Killer's Accounts in the early hours of July 22, 1997, Gothenburg's night was disrupted by a sinister incident that unfolded in the city center. Jan Notvite, along with his companion Vlad and two friends, found themselves in a chance encounter with a stranger, Joseph Ben Medor. The encounter occurred near a park known as a gathering spot for gay men, where Joseph approached John and Vlad, expressing his curiosity about Satanism. Initially trying to avoid Joseph's persistent inquiries, John and Vlad eventually invited him to John's home. However, upon observing Joseph's behavior and realizing he was homosexual, John and Vlad became offended and angry. When they reached John's residence, Joseph hesitated and refused to enter. Instead, John and Vlad proposed continuing their discussion about Satanism at Keeler's Park. Before departing, John retrieved a stun gun and a 9mm handgun from his home. Arriving at Keeler's Park, Vlad took the stun gun from John and used it on Joseph in an attempt to immobilize him. Despite his efforts to escape, Joseph's fate was sealed. Vlad seized the 9mm handgun from John and shot Joseph in the back, followed by a fatal shot to the head. Initially denying their involvement, both John and Vlad eventually confessed to their roles in the murder, providing similar accounts of the events. However, there was a significant discrepancy between their confessions. While John claimed Vlad had shot Joseph, Vlad insisted that John was the one who pulled the trigger, revealing the chilling details of a night that would haunt Gothenburg's memory. The Trial during the trial that followed the harrowing events of the Keeler's Park murder in July 1997, the motives behind the crime remained shrouded in darkness. The prosecution grappled with unraveling whether the act was a satanic ritual, a manifestation of the misanthropic Luciferian Order's sinister discussions about human sacrifices, or a hate crime fueled by the visceral anger John Notvite and Vlad experienced when confronted with Josef Ben Medor's sexual identity. Criminal Inspector Lars Olin, the driving force behind the police investigation, shed light on the complex motivations. Notvite, during interrogation, had initially claimed the murder was a sacrifice to Satan, but later withdrew this statement. Olin asserted that while Satanism undoubtedly cast a sinister shadow over the crime, homophobia also played a pivotal role. The Swedish police acknowledging the hate-filled undercurrent registered the Keeler's Park murder as a homophobic hate crime. In the ensuing legal proceedings, the Gothenburg District Court rendered its verdict on July 6, 1998. Notvite was found guilty of accessory to murder and illegal possession of a firearm, earning an eight-year prison sentence. Meanwhile, Vlad faced a graver conviction, found guilty of murder, violence against his girlfriend, illegal firearm possession, and possession of body parts, resulting in a 10-year prison term for him. Both parties challenged the court's decision, leading to an appeal. The Court of Appeal for Western Sweden deliberated and delivered its judgment on September 25, 1998. Vlad's sentence of 10 years was upheld. However, Notvite's sentence was increased to 10 years as well, solidifying the grim fate that awaited them behind bars. The trial, marked by its focus on the intertwining forces of Satanism, black metal and homophobia, swiftly moved forward. Driven by the chilling confessions of Vlad and John, each acknowledging their roles in the tragic demise of Joseph Ben Medor. What happened next? After serving seven years in prison, both Vlad and John were released in 2004. After his release from prison, John reformed his band Dissection, recruiting new members he felt could stand behind and live up to the demands of Dissection's satanic concept. They released a new album, but in 2006, Jan Notvite took his own life. He was found in his home, surrounded by a circle of lit candles, with a ritual book by his side. He left behind letters for his father and girlfriend, leaving a haunting legacy of violence and despair. Vlad, the other convicted murderer, seemingly moved forward with his life. There are unverified reports suggesting that he married his girlfriend. Under the alias Falsifer, it has also been claimed that Vlad may have authored several books, forming the Liber Falsifer series. But despite the passage of time, the details of his life after prison remain shrouded in mystery and ambiguity. Meanwhile, Joseph Ben Medor's remains were repatriated to Algeria, his home country. He was laid to rest in the capital city of Algiers, marking the end of a life tragically cut short. Criminal Inspector Lars Olin, the dedicated investigator who led the police efforts, shared insights into the case through an article published in the book titled Nordisk Criminal Chronica 1999. He shed light on the perplexing details of the crime, including unexplained burns that were found on Joseph's back, adding an eerie layer of mystery to the tragic events. 
The story of the Keeler's Park murder remains a chilling reminder of the darkness that can consume human hearts, leaving behind a legacy of pain, confusion, and unanswered questions. Conclusion In the annals of criminal history, the Keeler's Park murder case stands as a chilling testament to the depths of human darkness. The heinous acts committed by John Nodvite and Vlad shook not only the quiet streets of Gothenburg, but also the very fabric of society, leaving an indelible mark on the collective consciousness. This harrowing tale serves as a stark reminder of the complexities of human nature, where the interplay of sinister motives, occult beliefs, and deeply ingrained prejudices culminated in a tragedy that claimed the life of an innocent man, Joseph Ben Medour. Beyond the gruesome details of the crime, the case raises profound questions about the human capacity for malevolence and the blurred lines between reality and the occult. In reflecting on the Keeler's Park murder, society is compelled to confront the enduring specter of prejudice and hatred that lingers in the shadows. It is a call to action, urging us to foster understanding, tolerance, and compassion in the face of ignorance and bigotry. By illuminating the darkest corners of our society, we can strive to create a world where such heinous crimes find no fertile ground and where empathy and acceptance prevail. May the memory of Joseph Ben Medor serve as a poignant reminder of the human cost of intolerance, prompting us to work tirelessly toward a future where every life is valued and where the shadows of prejudice are dispelled by the light of empathy and unity. Thanks again for watching this latest true crime deep dive. This is a case I personally had never heard of before and found it fascinating to explore. Obviously, metal music was a central focus during the Satanic Panic era, and as a metal fan myself, I actually find it quite disheartening to discover incidents like this that almost seem to prove the fear-mongering to be valid. So let's all keep in mind that individuals and incidents like those mentioned in this case no more represent metal music than any other horrific acts represent the religions, races, or cultural identities of those any criminal claims to be a part of. Let me know your thoughts about this case down in the comments. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. June 1, 1981. The Chicago sky is dark and gloomy. Rain pounds against the concrete as three detectives approach a field behind the Rip Van Winkle Motel in Vila Park, responding to a call claiming a body has been found nearby. Nestled among dive bars and rundown shops, the motel is notorious for attracting dubious characters, known by various names like the Bear Rabbit Hotel and the Moonlit Hotel. It has a reputation as a rendezvous for quick encounters involving drugs, sex, and other illicit activities. The three detectives, their coats dripping with rainwater, approach the seedy motel having already made up their minds about what they're about to see. Another tragedy. Another normal day on the job, but what they were soon about to discover was anything but normal. And they could never have known just how deep and depraved a rabbit hole they were about to be sent down. The Ripper Crew, the most disturbing cult killers in American history, earlier that day a maid working in the motel had noticed a progressively worsening odor outside, prompting her manager to go and investigate it. Expecting to find a dead rat or something similar, the manager moved into the litter-strewn field behind the establishment, searching for the source. To his horror, he stumbled across the heavily decomposed remains of a young woman, her body almost entirely skeletal with only small fragments of flesh still clinging to her bones. When the three detectives arrived to see the same sight, they instantly recognized that the advanced state of decomposition meant that the body had been dead for a considerable length of time. Had she really been lying here unnoticed the entire time? Although there was a myriad of unanswered questions, one thing was perfectly clear. This woman had been murdered. Despite the advanced decomposition, with wildlife and maggots having taken their toll, the skeletal frame still bore handcuffs on the now exposed wrists, affirming the grim nature of her demise. A cloth gag remained lodged in her mouth, and though she wore a sweater, her underwear was pulled down. Surprisingly, a small wad of dollar bills remained in her socks, eliminating robbery as a motive and hinting at the much darker and more disturbing fate that had befallen her. 
The three detectives were now tasked with trying to ascertain the identity of the deceased woman and establish a time frame between her death and her discovery. A daunting task, given the condition of the body, especially back in the 80s, without access to many of the institutions and technologies we have today. The detectives and their teams also needed to determine whether the site where the woman's remains were found was the primary crime scene, or a secondary location where she had been disposed of after death. The absence of any previous reports of the body prior to the maid noticing the smell that day suggested that it might not have actually been there for an extended period of time. But if that was the case, then the perpetrator would have to have transported a rotten, decomposed body before dumping it behind the hotel. An unsettling idea for them to accept that even the most depraved killer could carry out. These doubts about the duration of time her body had been there prompted soil sample analysis to ascertain if bodily fluids had permeated the ground yet, to try and help them determine the time frame of abandonment. But before they could do that, they had to remove the decomposing corpse and deliver it to Deputy Coroner Pete Siegmann so he could attempt to establish a cause and manner of death. But after encountering difficulties obtaining fingerprints due to the horrific state of the body, hopes of identifying the unknown woman seemed slim. As they waited for their results, the detectives searched through missing person reports, but struggled to make any meaningful connections to the victim. After contacting the Chicago department, they were informed that the practice of concealing money in socks likely indicated the victim was a sex worker, making the chances of identifying her even less likely. But to their surprise, the coroner's hard work paid off, and he was able to obtain dental impressions from the victim that led to a match in less than two weeks, identifying her as Linda Sutton, 21. As they'd suspected, Linda was a prostitute with a history of arrests. Tragically, she was also the mother of two children, both of whom were living with her mother at the time. But then came the shocking and gruesome twist nobody saw coming. Despite the advanced decomposition of her body, the coroner determined Linda had only been dead for three days. But how the hell could that be possible, given the skeletal state of her remains? The coroner told the detectives that the accelerated decay resulted from significant chest wounds, where the victim's breasts had been completely removed, providing a gateway for parasites that rapidly consumed the body. He found that Linda had been brutally abused and assaulted, with the removal of her left breast having occurred while she was still alive. She had likely been held and tortured over the duration of a week, suffering stabbings, mutilation and assault, and the detectives were soon going to realize that she was just the first of many victims of a horrific cult that the media would soon dub the Ripper Crew. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This story is only just beginning, a spree of brutality. Months passed with no leads or developments on the disturbing case, and it soon grew cold. But then, on February 12th, 1982, the car of a 35-year-old cocktail waitress was discovered on the roadside. Though her tank was empty, her purse could still be seen on the front seat and her keys remained in the ignition. Yet there was no sign of her. Would she really have just left her belongings there like that and walked off? Unnerved as the police searched nearby for the missing woman, they came across another horrific sight. Her body lay strewn on a nearby embankment. She had been assaulted, tortured, and mutilated, with her breast being amputated. Within mere days of her body being found, Another grim discovery unfolded as the body of a Hispanic woman wearing an engagement ring was uncovered. She too had been a victim of violent assault and strangulation, and severe bite marks could be found on her breasts. Her twisted murderer had even masturbated over her lifeless body. However, neither of these cases were linked to the cold case of Linda Sutton. At least, not quite yet. Instead, they were suspected to be the result of different killers. The latter being profiled as a local man with a dark psychopathic side he hid behind familial normalcy. A couple of months later, as these cases had also turned cold, on the morning of May 15th, Lorraine Borowski, known as Lori, was seen leaving her residence at Elmhurst Gardens at around 8 a.m., headed towards the Remax office on St. Charles Road where she was employed. But when her boss, Donald Stibb, arrived at the office at 8.30, he found that the door was still locked. As he entered, he noticed scattered items on the sidewalk in front of the building, women's shoes, a keychain with keys, and cosmetics. Assuming a woman had dropped her belongings, he gathered them and brought them inside, subsequently alerting the police. But as he awaited the arrival of law enforcement, Donald noticed something on the keychain. It bore a key with his own company's name. Recounting the incident to Detective Raymond Bradford, he stated, I saw all the stuff on the ground and I didn't think anything of it. Then, I saw the Remax keychain. I tried the key and it fit our lock. 
Believing the recovered items belonged to Lori, Donald and the detective ventured outside to scour the vicinity for her. The detective contacted her neighbors, gathering information on what she was wearing that fateful morning. Khaki slacks paired with a white ruffled blouse, and she carried a beige purse with wooden handles. Lori's boss added details about her typical jewelry, mentioning four gold rings and an ankle chain. A be on the lookout alert was issued for Lori as she was deemed to be in imminent danger. All the evidence seemed to indicate she had been taken from outside her workplace, possibly as she prepared to unlock the door. Lori's whereabouts would remain elusive for four months until the discovery of her body on October 10th, 1982, by hunters navigating the Clarendon Hills Cemetery near Westmont, dumped amidst the thicket, her clothing scattered nearby. The grim find was in a place her family had searched shortly before the hunters stumbled upon her. Because of this, the assumption arose that her captors not only prolonged her life post-abduction, but retained her lifeless form for a period before disposing of it in the cemetery. Post-mortem examination exposed the harrowing details of Lori's ordeal. She had endured repeated acts of sexual violence, with a wire tightly encircling one breast until it severed. Savage beatings marred her body, and an unsettling discovery indicated the insertion of an object into the wound left by her severed breast. Lori ultimately met her demise at the hands of a hatchet. A mere two weeks after the abduction and attack on Lori, another woman was targeted, Shui Mak. A recent immigrant to the United States had spent just three years in the country since relocating from Hong Kong to contribute to her family's restaurant, Ling Ling's in Streamwood. On the evening of May 29, 1982, after concluding her work shift, Shui departed the family's restaurant in the company of her brother, Kent. A disagreement ensued during their car journey regarding Kent's decision to appropriate a table from the restaurant for use in painting the garage at home. While on the highway, Kent pulled over and instructed Shui to exit the vehicle, urging her to catch a ride home with their parents, who were en route. Kent continued his journey, leaving Shui stranded at the intersection of Barrington and Irving Park Roads in Hanover Park. Ling, their sister, was driving the other car that night and passed Shui along the roadside. It wasn't until both vehicles reached home that they realized Shui still awaited pickup. Immediately they set out to retrieve her. But their search proved futile as Shui was now nowhere to be found. Concerned by their inability to locate Shui, the family promptly contacted the police. Their anxiety stemmed from Shui's lack of funds, absence of identification, and her lack of proficiency in English. Despite law enforcement efforts to scour the area, the girl remained untraceable. A be on the lookout alert was issued for Shui, describing her last known attire. A red sweater, black pants, and sandals. Towards the end of September 1982, authorities received a distressing call reporting the discovery of a woman's lifeless body in a field east of Barrington Road in the town of South Barrington. The location was a mere mile from where Shui had disembarked from her brother's car that pivotal night. Shui's remains were found clad in the same red sweater and black slacks she had worn on that fateful evening. The subsequent autopsy unveiled a fatal skull fracture as the cause of her demise. And once again, her body echoed the pattern of mutilation seen in the previous victims. Ling, Shui's sister, could only identify her by the distinctive clothing she wore. The police found themselves grappling with a string of eerily similar killings, all involving young women who had suffered the gruesome loss of a breast. Despite the clear pattern, leads remained frustratingly elusive in all of these likely connected cases, that is, until the emergence of another victim, Angel York, who managed to survive her ordeal. On June 13th, Angel willingly entered a van with an individual she presumed to be a John, given her occupation as a prostitute. However, the John turned out to be more than one assailant. Once inside the van, her attackers restrained her by handcuffing her to the vehicle's interior. Shockingly, one of the men handed her a knife and instructed her to mutilate her own breast. Angel recounted that after complying, one of the assailants descended into a violent frenzy. He reclaimed the knife, inflicting further harm to her breast, and then committed a disturbing act by ejaculating into the wound. Upon concluding the assault, he sealed the wound with duct tape before callously abandoning Angel on the street. Distraught and horrifically wounded, Angel managed to promptly contact the police to report the harrowing incident. Although she provided descriptions of her attackers, law enforcement faced challenges in locating them. Unfortunately, Angel had limited information about the van and lacked details about the assailants' names, while the detectives unfortunately had little to go off of. 
they did finally have the knowledge that some sort of group was potentially behind this string of horrific murders. Regrettably, law enforcement was unable to prevent the subsequent murder of another vulnerable young prostitute, Sandra Delaware, in August. Dumped along the Chicago River, Delaware exhibited signs of the same modus operandi, wrists bound, breast removed, and a ligature around her throat. The subsequent autopsy revealed that her body had been found a mere six hours after her demise. Less than a month later, on September 8, 1982, the lifeless body of Rose Beck Davis, a 30-year-old marketing executive from Broadview, was discovered in an alley. She had been callously discarded under a stairwell belonging to a three-story North Lake Shore apartment building in the Gold Coast neighborhood. Positioned on her back, Rose's nearby discarded sweater seemed forcibly torn from her body. Her blue corduroy slacks were also found in close proximity, drawing immediate attention from investigators who noted unsettling similarities to the wounds inflicted on previous victims. A subsequent autopsy unveiled the horrifying extent of Rose's ordeal. She had been repeatedly stabbed, assaulted, and strangled with a black sock. Her visage bore the brutal marks of a severe beating, rendering her nearly unrecognizable. Numerous small cuts and punctures marred her stomach, while her breast suffered the same fate as the preceding victims. Ultimately, Rose met her demise through numerous hatchet blows to the face and head. Then, on October 6, 1982, everything changed for the case. Beverly Washington was discovered near the railroad tracks in Chicago's Humboldt Park. Unlike the other victims of the Ripper crew, Beverly miraculously clung to life, having been mistakenly presumed dead by her assailants who callously dumped her body. Fortuitously, Beverly was stumbled upon by a passerby who promptly called for assistance. She was found with multiple injuries, including the amputation of her left breast, a severely slashed right breast, and numerous stab wounds inflicted upon her body. This particular attack would prove to be the undoing of the Ripper crew. Beverly recounted her harrowing experience to the police, describing an encounter with a red Dodge van with tinted windows. The driver had approached her, inquiring about the cost for a date. Despite offering more than she had requested, she grew uneasy, but decided to enter the van anyway. In her detailed statement to the authorities, she mentioned distinctive features such as feathers hanging from the rearview mirror attached to a roach clip. The driver, a slender white man around 25 years old, wore a flannel shirt and square-toed boots during the attack. Beverly described him having greasy brown hair and a mustache. Once inside the van, the man brandished a gun, instructing Beverly to move to the rear of the vehicle, separated by a plywood divider. Accessible through a hinged plywood door, the back of the van featured wooden shelves housing tools and electrical wiring. Under the man's orders, Beverly undressed, complying as he handcuffed her and coerced her into performing oral sex. She recounted how the interior of the van was lined with carpet on both the floor and ceiling. Beverly continued her chilling narrative, stating, Then he assaulted me and shoved some pills into my mouth and made me wash them down with soda pop. As she began to lose consciousness, she saw the man holding a cord fearing he intended to kill her. I blacked out, and the next thing I remember, I was in the hospital. Mere hours after the discovery of Beverly's body, the Ripper crew approached a phone booth in their van. Opening fire, they targeted Rafael Torado and an unidentified man accompanying him. Both individuals sustained gunshot wounds, but Rafael was the intended victim and the sole fatality. Identifying the Rippers, the specifics Beverly was able to offer about both the vehicle and her attackers played a pivotal role in a timely arrest. Detective Warren Wilkos took to Cicero Avenue, engaging with prostitutes and distributing flyers detailing the Ripper Crew's van particulars. Eventually, the Chicago police tracked down the van on North Central Avenue. The driver, a husky red-haired man, didn't align with Beverly Washington's description. However, upon inspection, the interior matched Beverly's detailed account exactly. The driver turned out to be Edward Spritzer. Upon questioning, he revealed that the van belonged to his boss, Robin Gecht. When asked about his destination, Spritzer mentioned meeting his boss at an apartment under renovation. The officers followed the van to the location, and Spritzer informed his boss that some cops wished to speak with him. Upon encountering Robin Gecht, officers immediately noticed a striking resemblance to Beverly's description. Gecht even wore the same type of shirt and boots she had mentioned. However, the most unsettling aspect was Gecht's unnervingly calm demeanor. It was a moment of either mistaken identity or a chilling encounter with a true psychopath. The officers informed Gecht about the van's association with a potential crime and directed him to the Area 5 headquarters for questioning. Gecht complied, showing no fear or emotion. 
Simultaneously, technicians searched the van and discovered a pill. Subsequent lab analysis confirmed it was a sedative tablet, mirroring the victim's account of being forced to swallow a similar substance. With the identification of Robin Gecht, investigators initiated a comprehensive examination of him. Their findings revealed that two years preceding the onset of the murders, Gecht had faced arrest and charges related to contributing to the sexual delinquency of a 14-year-old girl. Significantly, during his arrest, Gecht resided in Hanover Park, a location coinciding with the disappearance of Schwemach around the same period. As they delved deeper into Gecht's background, investigators unearthed a troubling incident from his teenage years. He had molested his own sister. Subsequently, his family sent him to live with his grandmother. During the initial encounter, Gecht had been cooperative and willing to converse with the police. During this phase, their inquiries were primarily focused on his van. Initially tight-lipped, Spritzer and Gecht provided limited information. However, cracks began to appear, particularly in Spritzer, who displayed signs of breaking down under the weight of genuine fear instilled by Gecht. The shocking confessions, intensifying their efforts, Authorities succeeded in compelling Spritzer to disclose the gruesome details, burdened by guilt for his actions. This process resulted in a comprehensive 78-page statement from Spritzer. His revelations commenced with an admission of driving the van while Gecht committed a fatal drive-by shooting, leaving one man dead and another paralyzed. Investigators swiftly corroborated this incident. Following this, Gecht directed Spritzer to slow down to pick up a black prostitute. Gecht engaged in sexual acts with her before taking her into an alley where he used a knife to sever her left breast, placing it on the van's floor. Spritzer, visibly disturbed, recounted his discomfort with the bloodshed during these horrific episodes. He further disclosed that, on occasion during their stalking activities there were instances when Gecht, in a heightened state of excitement, would immediately engage in sexual acts with a severed breast. Instead of waiting until they returned to the apartment where their satanic ritual was supposed to take place, Additionally, Spritzer described Gecht's heinous act of shooting a black woman in the head, chaining her, and weighting her down in water using bowling balls, leading him to believe she was never found. He also recounted an instance when Gecht bludgeoned a woman to death with a hammer, causing Spritzer to involuntarily vomit at the gruesome sight. Spritzer admitted that it took him some time before he could personally amputate a breast, under the coercion of his leader Gecht. He confessed uncertainty about the woman's status when he removed both her breasts, and he made no attempt to ascertain if she was dead or alive. Following the removal, Gecht compelled him to engage in sexual acts with the open wounds. In his testimony to investigators, Spritzer depicted Robin Gecht as being consumed by an insatiable bloodlust during the murders. He described an incident where Gecht ruthlessly hacked off a woman's breast in an alley while she was still alive. Subsequently, after severing the breast, Gecht engaged in sexual acts with the gruesome wound. Despite the woman's screams and the gushing blood, Gecht remained unfazed. After completing the assault, he took an axe and mercilessly beat the woman to death. The culmination of Spritzer's revelations left investigators stunned, detailing seven outright murders and one aggravated battery. During interviews with Gecht's wife, she reluctantly disclosed that Gecht had subjected her to extreme actions, including the actual slicing of her breasts. Despite this being against her will, she had never reported her husband to the authorities. Detectives expanded their inquiries to individuals acquainted with Gecht from the neighborhood. It became evident that not only his criminal associates, but also a majority of those who crossed paths with him harbored a profound fear of him. Some individuals shared with the police that Gecht seemed to possess an inexplicable influence over them, capable of drawing them in and compelling them to carry out his wishes. One apprehensive individual cautioned the officer never to meet Gecht's gaze, asserting that it had the power to ensnare. They recounted heinous acts Gecht had coerced them into, actions they detested but found themselves unable to refuse. While Spritzer was providing his confession, Robin Gecht remained seated in another interrogation room with his lawyer, maintaining the same calm and composed demeanor as on the initial day. Armed with the details from Spritzer's admission, Investigators placed pictures of the seven victims on the table before Gecht. However, he steadfastly denied any knowledge of them. In an attempt to unsettle him, the police escorted Gecht down the hall to witness Spritzer confessing. Witnesses reported that Gecht displayed no visible signs of being perturbed, continuing to claim his innocence. However, within the room where Spritzer was located, the atmosphere underwent a drastic shift. The moment Spritzer laid eyes on Gecht, he turned pale and abruptly altered his narrative. 
Spritzer hastily retracted his confession, asserting that Gecht had never committed any murders. His account grew chaotic, leaving interrogators bewildered. Spritzer shifted blame to another man, his girlfriend's brother Andrew Kokorales. Although he provided scant details about him, Gecht acknowledged knowing Kokorales and furnished the police with an address, but his demeanor remained undisturbed. Curiously, he claimed to be completely unaware of Kokorales' crimes, in contrast to Spritzer's accounts. Perplexed, the police turned to question the third member of the alleged killing crew, harboring doubts about the plausibility of three men engaging in such horrific acts together. Little did they know, the unfolding revelations were only scratching the surface. Regrettably, the evidence against Robin Gecht was insufficient to detain him, necessitating his release. In an effort to gather more information, investigators presented a photo array, including Gecht's picture, to Beverly Washington in the hospital. Despite weeks of recovery from her injuries, she identified Gecht as the assailant. With Gecht now maintaining silence, detectives opted to speak with individuals in his life who were not believed to be involved in the crimes. It was revealed that in his younger years, Gecht had asked girls he was dating to allow him to stab them with pins in the breast during intimate encounters. Convinced they had the correct individuals, investigators persisted in delving into the Ripper crew's histories during the period of the murders, aiming to establish links to the crimes. In 1981, Gecht had leased a room at the Rip Van Winkle Motel for an extended period. Edward Spritzer and Andrew Kokorales, alongside his brother Thomas, had also rented three adjoining rooms. The investigators uncovered this information when the Kokorales brothers redirected their mail from this address upon relocating leaving a trace with the U.S. Postal Service. Upon interviewing the motel manager, he vividly recalled the men, having taken note of their boisterous gatherings, describing them as some kind of cultists. The men were known to frequently bring numerous women back to their rooms. Detectives swiftly succeeded in breaking Andrew Kokorales during the interrogation. He began disclosing chilling details about the kidnapped and murdered women with an unsettling precision that matched the coroner's reports. Cocorales delved into the harrowing specifics of how they abducted women for the purpose of assault and torture, revealing their routine use of knives and other implements like razors, tin can lids, and can openers to mutilate their victims. He provided further elaboration on the use of piano wire to amputate the breasts of different women, confirming the crew's disturbing practice of taking turns masturbating into the severed breasts before consuming parts of them during what he claimed were satanic rituals. In a shocking admission, Andrew Kokorales confessed to being involved in 18 murders, which included victims Lorraine Borowski and Rose Beck Davis. He also recounted the assault and murder of victim Sandra Delaware, offering explicit details. Kokorales described how they silenced her screams by placing a rock in her mouth during the attack. After forcing themselves upon her, they proceeded to stab her body with a knife and mutilate her before strangling her to death. His grim account was completely corroborated by the autopsy report. Initially, when investigators engaged in conversation with his younger, slow-witted brother, Thomas Cocorales, his statements were riddled with inconsistencies, and he struggled to maintain a coherent narrative. Subsequently, a polygraph test administered at the police station yielded negative results, indicating deception. Armed with the additional confessions from his accomplices and Thomas Cocorales's failed polygraph, securing his confession proved relatively uncomplicated. Thomas disclosed to detectives that he, along with the other men, would bring women to Gecht's residence, which harbored a satanic chapel in the attic. In this sinister space, they subjected women to acts of assault and torture, frequently employing knives and ice picks for mutilation. He detailed the use of a wire garrote for the removal of women's breasts. Following the gruesome act of breast removal, they would engage in a disturbing ritual. Each participant would masturbate into the severed breast, and then, as a sacrament, consume a portion of it. Thomas described this macabre act of consuming flesh as taking communion. Gecht, the leader, would preserve the removed breasts in a box, with Thomas recalling a count of 15 inside. During his recorded confession, Thomas admitted to being present during three murders, including that of Lorraine Borowski. Elmhurst police detective John Miller, who sat through Thomas's confession, expressed his shock, stating, I've handled numerous homicide cases, and I had never encountered anything so horrendous in my life. It's noteworthy that neither Edward Spritzer nor Andrew Cocorales implicated Thomas in their respective confessions, satanic rituals and killer clowns. Regular gatherings took place at Gecht's residence, 
timed conveniently after his wife's late-night departure for work and his children's bedtime. Within his attic, a satanic chapel had been fashioned, complete with a red-clothed altar and eerie ambiance illuminated solely by the flickering candles. The walls adorned with six red and black crosses set the stage for their sinister activities. Tragically, the majority of the Ripper crew's victims met their gruesome fate in this very attic. The women endured torture at the hands of the men, who wielded knives and employed piano wire to cruelly amputate their breasts. Throughout these horrific acts, Gecht recited passages from the Satanic Bible. Notably, the perpetrators conducted the breast amputations while the victims were still alive. As part of their ritualistic sacrament, they consumed the severed breasts in the attic, even if the killings occurred elsewhere. Gecht continued to read passages while each man took turns engaging in disturbing acts. Afterward, Gecht would cut the flesh into pieces, and they would all partake in consuming it. Within the Ripper crew, there existed a belief that their leader, Gecht, possessed supernatural powers. According to them, he harnessed these abilities to exert mental and physical control over his followers. Just as they had been drawn to him, the crew believed Gecht used his powers to ensnare others. They recounted feeling entranced, powerless to escape him and his supernatural influence. This perceived power facilitated Gecht's ability to manipulate them into committing acts of murder and cannibalism in accordance with his will. Upon apprehension by the police, the crew resorted to a common excuse often cited by followers of criminal leaders. They feared dire consequences, even death, if they defied their leader's commands. Thomas Kokorales conveyed the sense of submission to Gecht's will, stating, you just have to do it, highlighting the unquestioning obedience prevalent among the followers. While Gecht may have displayed a more overtly sadistic nature than some leaders, his method of attracting followers mirrored that of others. He targeted men seeking a sense of belonging to something greater than themselves, a desire to feel significant. This shared yearning for significance extends beyond Gecht's crew and finds parallels with groups such as Manson's family, individuals who turned a blind eye to sexual abuse at Penn State University, and devout followers of the Catholic Church. In each case, a willingness to forgive even the most reprehensible acts stemmed from a desire to belong to a larger entity. Similar to Manson's followers, Gecht's crew maintained silence in court, refusing to testify against him. Even in captivity, he wielded a compelling allure, exercising a formidable degree of power and persuasion over his followers. The Ripper crew is a rare case of a serial killing group, and it becomes even more extraordinary when you discover that its leader, Gecht, was once employed by another notorious serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. In the late 1970s, Gacy owned the company PDM Contractors, and Gecht was one of its employees. Gacy, infamous for murdering young men, burying them beneath his house and adopting a clown persona, hinted at having an accomplice during his trial. Although he never disclosed the partner's identity, suspicions arose. Initially, a deceased young man who had worked for Gacy was attributed to the notorious serial killer. However, police later determined that Gacy was out of town at the time of the murder. Gacy claimed his accomplice committed the act without his consent. The question thus arises, could Robin Gecht have been the elusive partner he alluded to? Though many suspect it to be the case, the truth remains uncertain, as Gecht staunchly denies any wrongdoing. And John Wayne Gacy was executed in 1994, likely taking the secret to his grave with him. Following the arrest of the crew, the police executed search warrants at their residences. In Gecht's attic, they uncovered the Satanic Chapel, along with a rifle matching the one used in the shooting of Rafael Torado. Following interrogations, the team of killers faced a $1 million bond at Pontiac Correctional Center on various charges. Gecht vehemently denied the allegations despite his previous association with John Wayne Gacy. Gacy's actions were actually mocked and dismissed by Gecht, who said that Gacy's mistake was keeping bodies under the house, not the killings themselves. As investigations continued, more people revealed their fear of Gecht and belief in his manipulative powers. Witnesses attested to his ability to draw people toward him and bend them to his will. The media seized upon the story, crafting headlines that associated the Ripper crew or Chicago Rippers with the infamous Jack the Ripper. The Trials of Robin Gecht In an attempt to avoid trial, Gecht put forward an insanity plea. Despite being evaluated and found competent to stand trial, as well as deemed sane at the time of the offenses, he faced a mistrial, leading to the commencement of his second trial on September 20, 1983. The prosecution presented compelling evidence, including the discovery of the chapel 
and the rifle used in the shooting found during their search of his property. Satanic literature and a trophy box owned by Gecht, containing as many as 15 pieces of female breast, were also found. The jury was provided with detailed accounts of the modus operandi from victim reports. Women were kidnapped, held captive, tortured with implements like needles and ice picks, assaulted and subjected to having their breasts sliced off with a garroting wire for a satanic ritual. While many victims died, two survivors bore the memories of these harrowing ordeals. Gecht took the stand to defend himself, admitting to the attack on Beverly Washington, but vehemently denying involvement in any killings, sexual assaults, or aggravated battery. He claimed innocence, asserting that during the period of most murders, he had no association with the other defendants. Despite eyewitness testimony and accounts from women claiming Gecht had requested them to self-mutilate, the confessions of his accomplices were deemed inadmissible. Lacking physical evidence linking him to murder, Gecht could not be prosecuted directly for the killings, and his accomplices refused to testify against him. Nevertheless, the jury found Gecht guilty on all charges, including attempted murder, rape, deviate sexual assault, aggravated battery, and armed violence. He received a 120-year prison sentence. The trials of Thomas Cocorales, initially, Thomas Cocorales attempted to have his confessions thrown out, but the motion was unsuccessful. The Dupage County jury convicted Cocorales of the rape and murder of Lorraine Borowski. After the judge dismissed the prosecution's death penalty sentence, he was sentenced to life in prison. During the trial, Cocorales opted not to testify but spoke during sentencing, vehemently denying any involvement in the charged crimes. In 1986, the state appeals court overturned the guilty verdict citing legal errors in the original trial. Subsequently, Thomas Cocorales was granted a new trial. A year later, Cocorales entered a guilty plea to the murder of Lorraine Borowski and received a 70-year sentence. In 2017, Thomas Cocorales became eligible for parole, prompting authorities to attempt to have him committed as a sexually violent person, which would secure his continued incarceration. To enact this statute, they needed to establish that it was substantially probable that Cocorales would commit further acts of sexual violence. References were made to Cocorales admitting to additional heinous assaults and murders while in prison. In a taped interview from 1982, he detailed his involvement in the assault of Shui Mak. Over the years, he confessed to participating in other crimes committed by the Ripper crew during interviews with mental health professionals, prison officers, and the press. Psychiatrists evaluated Cocorales in 2017, concluding that he was not sexually violent. Thomas Cocorales was released from prison after serving only half of his sentence and is required to register as a sex offender as long as he resides in Illinois. There have been mass protests and public outcries near the apartment he was residing in after his release. Detective Warren Wilkosh commented on Cocorales's release, expressing a lack of strong opinions. However, he emphasized that Gecht's potential parole would be a whole different thing, asserting he made Manson look like a Boy Scout. The trials of Andrew Cocorales. Andrew Cocorales faced trials in two different counties. In the first trial, he was accused of the murder of Rose Beck Davis. According to his confession, he had participated in her abduction, forced her into the van, and brutally beaten her to death with a hatchet. The jury deliberated for just three hours before finding him guilty, resulting in a life sentence during his second trial. Although he initially confessed during police interrogations, Cocorales recanted his confessions before trial, claiming that the police coerced his statements. On the stand, he vehemently denied ever assaulting or killing anyone, asserting that his confessions were forced by the police. Despite Prosecutor Brian Tellander presenting evidence from multiple interrogations conducted by different detectives and prosecutors, Cocorales insisted that they had all dictated his statements. He also alleged that a police officer had provided him with details of the crime scene facilitating his confession. However, Detective Warren Wilkos testified that Cocorales had identified Lorraine Borowski from a photo lineup on his own and confessed, saying, that's the girl Eddie Spritzer and I killed in the cemetery. The credibility of the conflicting accounts became the focal point. Cocorales appeared sullen and angry, and his narrative of eight officials treating him uniformly unethically seemed implausible. The jury, reportedly deliberating for only an hour, rendered a guilty verdict for the murder of Lorraine Borowski, rejecting the claim that eight individuals had coerced him to lie and condemned him to death. At the sentencing hearing, Cocorales reiterated his innocence, and his defense argued that the crime did not warrant the death penalty. Testimonies from a prison chaplain and counselor portrayed Cocorales as non-threatening and capable of rehabilitation. 
He also contended that he had received ineffective counsel and that, regarding the earlier trial for the murder of Rose Beck Davis, the offense did not justify capital punishment but rather life imprisonment. Despite these arguments, the court upheld the sentence in 1989, dismissing appeals. In an attempt to alter their strategy, his attorneys pursued a different course of action. They contended that Cocorileus, suffering from schizophrenia, was a killer who was unaware of his actions during the murders. The argument asserted that the trial lawyers should have invoked an insanity defense, a crucial omission on their part. Surprisingly, they had not sought a psychiatric evaluation for Cocorileus, highlighting a significant oversight. The appeals attorneys further maintained that when the trial lawyers neglected to recognize the necessity for an evaluation, the trial judge should have mandated one for the court, which did not happen. It was noteworthy that a prison psychiatrist had diagnosed Cocorales with borderline personality disorder and declared him incompetent to stand trial. However, this psychiatric diagnosis did not render him incompetent or insane, making it a feeble argument at best. They argued that Cocorales was vulnerable to a strong influence implying diminished responsibility for his actions. When the district judge probed the trial attorneys on these matters, they asserted that no discernible pattern of abnormal behavior had led anyone acquainted with the defendant to suspect a psychiatric disorder. This assurance seemed to satisfy the judge, deeming the pending affidavit unpersuasive. Despite this, the appeals attorneys pointed to Cocorales' peculiar behavior as evidence of his aberrant condition. The court, after considering this argument, concluded that abnormal behavior did not necessarily indicate the level of mental impairment required for an insanity finding. In a comprehensive 41-page opinion, the court declared no reversible error and affirmed the sentence once again. However, this was not the conclusion of the narrative, as a movement gained momentum to challenge all death sentences in the state. Scheduled for execution on March 17, 1999, Andrew Cocorales faced a last-minute reprieve as efforts were made to persuade then-Illinois Governor George Ryan to intervene. Supreme Court Justice Moses Harrison ordered a stay of execution and called for a statewide moratorium on all executions in Illinois. The Chicago Tribune's investigative articles on legal system injustices, leading to the exoneration of 12 individuals from death row, had a profound impact on Governor Ryan. Some were cleared through DNA evidence, while others were exonerated due to revelations of legal system mishandling. The case of Anthony Porter, a black man with an IQ of 51, highlighted the flaws in the system. Porter had spent 16 years in prison for a double homicide and was awaiting execution on September 23, 1998. Exculpatory evidence surfaced, leading to a stay, and another man confessed to the crime. This case underscored the state of Illinois prosecuting and imprisoning an innocent man, prompting a reassessment of the death penalty system. Despite these developments, Governor Ryan initially hesitated to reform the system, especially in light of cases like Cocorales, seemingly deserving of the death penalty. The Illinois State Supreme Court overturned Harrison's stay with a 4-3 vote, and just hours before Cocorales was set to be executed, Governor Ryan issued a three-page statement emphasizing that the decision had been made by a jury following the law of the land. Ryan, noting the rejection of appeals over 16 years, saw no grounds to intervene further. Thus, no obstacles remained between Cocorales and his execution. On the morning preceding his execution, Cocorales, transported to a super-maximum security prison in Tams, Illinois, spent the day in prayer and fasting. He spoke to a few close friends on the phone bidding farewell and shared a moment of prayer and tears with his brother. Despite being strapped onto the gurney, Cocorales maintained hope for a last-minute pardon. Offering an apology to the Borowski family, he proclaimed the kingdom of heaven was at hand before receiving a lethal injection at 12.34 p.m. By January 2000, Governor Ryan added a 13th man to the list of those wrongly placed on death row, leading to a statewide moratorium on executions. Cocorales thus became the last man executed before the moratorium. Some critics speculated that Governor Ryan deliberately timed the moratorium to follow Cocorales' execution, given his prior doubts about the system. While anti-capital punishment advocates raised concerns, many believed justice had been served. However, the impact of Ryan's decision had contrasting effects on the Spritzer case. The trials of Edward Spritzer Spritzer entered a guilty plea on April 2, 1984 for the murders of Rose Davis, Sandra Delaware, Shui Mack, and drug dealer Rafael Torado. He received life sentences for each murder, along with additional time for various charges, ranging from rape to deviant sexual assault. However, he still faced trial for the Linda Sutton murder. In a bench trial before Judge Edward Kowal on February 25, 1986, 
Sprites are admitted to abducting Sutton near Wrigley Field, subjecting her to sexual assault, mutilating her and ultimately causing her death. Public defender Carol Anfinson, representing Spritzer, portrayed her client as an immature, impulsive individual merely following orders. Anfinson attempted to shift blame onto leader Robin Gecht, emphasizing Spritzer's alleged fear for his own life. Witnesses called to the stand by friends testified to Spritzer's generally easygoing demeanor and past experiences of bullying. However, another friend contradicted these assertions, recounting Spritzer's boasts about his actions against the victims including mutilations and self-inflicted killings. Despite Anfinson's plea for mercy, Spritzer was convicted on March 4th of aggravated kidnapping and murder. On March 20th, a jury deliberated for an hour before sentencing him to death for the Sutton murder. Consequently, he found himself on death row in the Pontiac State Correctional Facility in Joliet, Illinois. Despite claims by his attorney Gary Pritchard that Spritzer had been denied due process and had suffered brain damage, all appeals were exhausted. Pritchard argued that the jury had not been adequately instructed, but it seemed the case had reached its conclusion. However, in an unexpected turn of events, in October 2002, as part of the review of death row cases due to the moratorium on capital punishment, Spritzer, then 41, had his case reconsidered among 140 others. Pritchard sought mercy based on Spritzer's low IQ and troubled history, emphasizing his susceptibility to manipulation by individuals like Robin Gecht. Despite this, Victims' families opposed a change in Spritzer's sentence, considering him the personification of evil. Prosecutor Michael Wolfe concurred, labeling his crimes as the worst of the worst. Although clemency was not granted during this review, Governor Ryan, as he left office in January 2003, issued pardons for four of the 164 death row inmates and granted blanket clemency to the remainder, including Edward Spritzer. While families expressed outrage and vowed to fight for justice, Spritzer had finally secured an unexpected reprieve. As a result, Spritzer's sentence was commuted to life in prison. The Aftermath of Evil On November 16, 1988, a tragic incident befell Robin Gecht's family. His mother Loretta, sister Rochelle, and nephew Nicholas, who had visited him in prison, were involved in a car accident on their way home. The collision occurred between two semi-trucks, resulting in the instant deaths of Loretta and Nicholas while Rachel lingered in a coma for four months before eventually succumbing. In March of 1999, Robin Gecht's son David faced legal troubles when he was arrested for first-degree murder. At 18 years old, David shot and killed Roberto Cruz in northwest Chicago. Tried as an adult, he received a 45-year prison sentence. Throughout the years, Robin Gecht has participated in numerous interviews, consistently maintaining his innocence and expressing optimism about potential DNA evidence that could supposedly exonerate him. Gecht is quoted saying, First mistake is considering me a serial killer. I am not considered one. I have never killed or took part in any such acts nor ever been charged in any murders of anyone. I'm not an angel, but I never intentionally hurt anyone unless it was to protect myself or my family. I could never live with killing or knowing I was responsible for taking one's life. Jennifer Furio initiated a unique project involving correspondence with serial killers, and both Robin Gecht and Eric Spritzer responded. Their letters featured in her book, The Serial Killer Letters. Furio states that Spritzer falsely claimed to have turned himself in during the initial investigation. In the letter, Spritzer expressed supposed remorse for his role in the crimes, claiming he felt bad about the bloodshed and passing out at its sight. He attributed his actions to fear of Gecht and his shotgun, emphasizing that he never acted alone. Furio characterized him as weak, vulnerable, directionless, illiterate, and an easy target due to a troubled home life and substance abuse. According to Spritzer, Gecht offered him a job during a tough period, making empty promises and later blackmailing him with obscene photographs. Spritzer portrayed himself as sweet and gentle, seemingly incongruent with a murderer. He hoped for love and marriage before his then imminent execution. Spritzer maintained that the murders were not planned but random, with Gecht ordering him to stop the van whenever he saw a woman with appealing breasts. He believed the Cocorelli's brothers were also coerced into these actions. Despite little knowledge of them, he empathized more with them than the actual victims, asserting the executed Andrew was too young to die. In her interviews with Gecht, he delved into his purported obsession with breasts, attributing it to a familial trait. Well, in an answer to your question on the obsession with breasts, Gecht explains, it is a thing with my entire family going back, as I'm told, to great-grandfather. 
Each of us men has married large-breasted women. My ex-wife is a 39D, and yes, she was very satisfying to me. He then clarifies his stance on sex with breasts, stating, As to your question about having sex with breasts, I have no real obsession with breasts in that form. Only a very sick person would even think of that. His phrasing of this answer in particular makes me feel extremely uncomfortable. In examining this Manson-esque killer, who influenced others to commit harm, criminologist Eric W. Hickey's emphasized the shared pathology and symbiotic relationship in such cases, where power is experienced both by committing and witnessing murder. The collaboration adds to the excitement, enabling them to accomplish things within the dangerous dynamics of their association that they might not achieve alone. Drawing from Hickey's study involving over 300 serial killers, it was noted that 74% of team killers are white, with female participation occurring around one-third of the time. The majority of cases involved two offenders working together, and 15% of serial murder victims were attributed to team killers. Psychological control was a consistent element, with one individual maintaining dominance within the team. What are your thoughts on whether certain individuals possess such persuasive power over others? Alternatively, do you believe these individuals simply identify the latent desires of others and skillfully encourage them to act upon those inclinations? It's hard to imagine any normal person being able to be convinced to do some of the absolutely horrific things the Ripper crew did, even under threat, duress, or manipulation. Whatever the case, there is no doubt that Robin Gecht is a true monster in every sense of the word and doesn't deserve to see a day of his remaining life outside of prison. Gecht is due to be up for parole in 2042. If he survives that long, he will be over 90 years old. If you're still watching right now, thank you so much for sticking with me through this extremely long deep dive. This is a particularly dark and brutal case to explore, so I'm hoping it doesn't get taken down due to the disturbing subject matter being discussed. Let me know your thoughts about this horrific cult of killers down in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this video, there are probably some other videos on screen right now you might enjoy watching next. And don't forget to like and subscribe to see more from my channel. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.